Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this is our last Leaders, Innovators and Disruptors um, event for 2020. So thank you uh, to those that have joined us throughout the series and welcome to those who are just joining us for today's event. Uh, we're very lucky to have Professor Debbie Haskey Leventhal with us today, who is going to discuss purpose-driven business as a force for good. Uh, but before we get into the event itself, I would just like to uh, play Macquarie University's Welcome to Country video. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. So I too would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and acknowledge that we're meeting on uh, various lands today. So if anyone would like to pop um, the land in which they're joining us from stay into the chat box, then please do so. Um, so like I said, this is our last event of 2020. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to welcome uh, Professor Debbie Haskey Leventhal to present the last event. Um, we've been very fortunate enough to have um, very inspirational speakers throughout the event series this year. So this is going to be a great way to, um, to end the year. So just a little bit about Debbie. Debbie is a professor of management at Macquarie University Business School and an expert on corporate social responsibility responsible management education and volunteerism. She is an author of Strategic CSR Tools and Theories for Responsible Management, The Purpose Driven University, and Employee Engagement in Corporate Social Responsibility. Debbie is a TED speaker. I was very fortunate to be there on the day that Debbie spoke. Fantastic, um, fantastic few minutes. And I might actually pop the YouTube video in the chat so you can all have a look. Uh, she's a public speaker on purpose, social responsibility, and the future of higher education. Debbie has published over 50 academic papers, and her work was covered by the media, including the New York Times. So very impressive background, Debbie. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll hand over to you from here. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure being here. Um, and I thank everyone for joining us. And it's a great way to end the year. Tomorrow I'm going on a month leave, so what a better way of uh, spending my last day at work. So today I'll be talking about purpose-driven businesses as a force for good, looking at uh, purpose, impact, and um, inspirational meaningfulness in life and so i'll talk for about 30 minutes or so and then we'll open it up to for q a so as i speak if you have any questions popping up either about the cases i'm showing you or some of the concepts and the ideas you can just note them down and then when we open it up for q a uh, you can jump in and, and ask your questions I'm going to start with a bit of a negative uh, beginning because our world can be a little bit daunting. A little bit is an understatement. If you listen to the news in the last few days, weeks, months, and this year was particularly special, <laughs> um, it doesn't look so good. So of course we have COVID-19 overtaking everything, but at the same time, we still have a lot of people dealing with extreme poverty, um, food and water scarcity, climate change and all its impact, natural disasters. Uh, we almost forgot that we had major bushfires just before COVID had hit, hit. And so all these things are dominating our lives to a point where they're called wicked problems. They're all interconnected. 
and you can't just solve them and address them easily because there are a lot of other problems connected to each of these issues that I have mentioned, a lot of it also being political. So the way that I thought, how do we become the change that we want to see in the world is by using the power of purpose, passion, and responsibility in individuals and in organizations to try and address some of these issues. So we'll talk a little bit about social innovation, social entrepreneurship, but also how as individuals we can address those issues, what is our role. So to begin, we'll look at business as a force for good. Um, and of course, I teach in a business um, school and I teach business management. And I think that we don't speak enough about the power of business to solve the issues that we have shown. A lot of businesses through their corporate social responsibility moved from being harmful to doing less harm or being harmful, but giving some money to charity to, to make themselves feel good about themselves. Here, I'm talking about taking a more holistic approach where you actually utilize the power, resources, knowledge, people, intellect, everything that the business has to address uh, the global challenges that we face. And it's not about acting as charitable donors, giving some money to charity or doing some corporate volunteering, but rather how do we act as businesses with all the knowledge that we put into maximizing profit into maximizing impact. And so that requires a shift from corporate philanthropy to a more holistic corporate social responsibility, social entrepreneurship or social business, social innovation and activism. All of these issues I will talk about later today. So I'm gonna start with one of the most inspirational examples that I know, but it is because it's not a company started off selling outdoor apparel and then thinking, oh, we could give some money to charity or we could do some good in the world. Yvonne Schinnard actually started Patagonia to show that businesses can be sustainable and that business can be a force for good to a point where on one of the Black Fridays, they put an ad saying, don't buy this jacket. Who have heard telling us not to buy their product? but they really are about showing that we can reduce consumption, repair, recycle, and not just keep buying things, especially nowadays. I mean, Patagonia was established many years ago, but nowadays with fast fashion and a lot of young people buying things that they only wear once, and sometimes not even once, then it's a mindset that we need to adopt. One of my favorite uh, recent example is when Patagonia actually <laughs> added this tag to their pants and shorts saying vote the a-holes out. Uh, they didn't say who the a-holes were just before the US elections, but they say vote for whoever supports sustainability. So I think everyone in the room can guess who they were referring to. Um, some say it's, you know, how can a company tell people who to vote for? But then others say this is the time now for businesses to take a political stance and say who they or what they believe in. And so if we move to uh, stuck. Uh, sorry. There was a link on one of the photos. So Patagonia and many other companies are so um, incredibly inspirational and create a strong consumer loyalty because they start with a why. You probably watched the Simon Sinek's TED talk about starting with why and how um, great companies lead um, with a purpose. If you haven't, you should watch it. And so what Simon Sinek says is that everyone knows what they do and how they do it. But the companies that really inspire us and the leaders that inspire us is the ones that know and articulate their why. So instead of just looking at what we do and how we do it, we explain why we do it. And although he mainly speaks about companies and one of his well-known phrases is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And you could see that with Patagonia, 
we could also apply it on an individual um, level and ask what is our why in our personal lives that leads me to the whole idea of purpose and so purpose is the reason for which something exists or the reason for which something was created so if i look around me um, there is this um, item that was created so it can hold water and also create an alternative sustainable solution to plastic bottles um, i could take anything here the tissue for your sniffles everything that i have around me was created to serve some kind of purpose but when we look at people and organizations it's obviously more complicated so how do we find and define and um, articulate our purpose as people and as organization and many people ask me how do i find my purpose how do i discover my purpose and i think the best way of thinking about it is not trying to wait for you know someone to knock on your door and give you an envelope saying here is your life purpose instead is starting to live a more purposeful life by um, looking at the impact that you can create through who you are and what you know so what i'm actually talking about is not just purpose in general where a lot of people would say my life purpose is to raise my kids protect my family and that's all fine but what I am actually talking about is impact purpose. How do we use our life purpose or our life to benefit others and make a difference in other people's lives? And when you do that, and in my TED talk, I talk about uh, how I started volunteering in university and I worked with this kid and I really felt like I made a difference in his life. And then I worked in the project that was in charge of 1000 volunteers that gave me such a sense of meaningfulness because I knew I was using my life and my time to uh, create a difference in other people's life. And that's the, the feeling that you get from having an impact purpose. So the best way to ask yourself, how can I find purpose is asking yourself, how can I serve others? Uh, there is a really nice phrase, but, but a quote by Gandhi, who said, um, you can find yourself and lose yourself in the service of others. And I think that really captures it well. So uh, I'm working now on my fourth book, which is about meaningfulness in life and at work. And looking at all these different models of meaningfulness and purpose, I came up with the idea of we can find personal purpose by tying what we know, what we do well, our talent, our skill, our capacity, with what gives us joy and passion, what gets us excited, and then see how we can use that to create an impact. I'll give you an example, um, someone I know, she um, likes running and jogging. And so she said, that's my hobby, it gives me joy. How can I use that to benefit others? And then she contacted people who have vision impairment and she said, why don't we run together? So they have this um, band and they run together um, with um, people who are, and then she started a whole movement to, to do that. That's the kind of thing where you could think, okay, yeah, I love photography. How can I use my photography to shed light on climate change or do whatever I can to try and create a positive impact in the world. That's personal purpose. Now let's move from the personal sphere to the workplace sphere. And uh, this has two aspects. The first one is my role, my work, the job that I do. Here again, I can find purpose in my role. I will go to impact first, okay? So I have my role, I know what I do, we all have job descriptions, but how can I use my role to benefit others? Or maybe how does my role already ben benefit others? So you try to think about the work that you do and try to capture the kind of impact that your work inspires. I remember reading a book and there was this person who was working with um, medical imaging devices. And then she became ill with cancer. And as she was going through the treatment, she noticed that the doctors were using the same medical devices that she was helping to produce. And then she said, oh, I finally got it. I understood that you know my work is meaningful. The question is not why she, uh, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> 
why she discovered it. The question is, why did she not discover it earlier? You don't need to get the service yourself to feel that you're serving others. So it's really important for people, as well as organization, organizations, to try and capture how I create an impact through my work. And of course, medical devices is an easy one. And if you are a GP, you can think about that. But every role is somehow serving people. So try to think about your role and what you're currently doing and how it already creates purpose. But then try to think about it even, you know, and take another step further and try to consider how can you use your role and your work to create further impact. So for example, for myself, um, I'm a professor, I teach business management, and so for years I said, okay, the way that I see the meaningfulness and purpose of my role is to inspire business students to go about and become more ethical and responsible leaders. And that's great. But then I thought, how can I further use my role to create impact? What if in some of my units, the students will work with emerging social enterprises, giving them free consultancy and help them create social impact? These are just a few of the ways that I try to find meaningfulness and purpose in my work. When you do that, what you get is the passion that I was talking about. Passion is not purpose. A lot of people use these uh, interchangeably. Passion, the way that I like to explain it, passion is like the fuel in the car. Purpose is the direction towards the car is going. You need the fuel, but you need to also know why you're going, where are you going, and that helps. So you need both of these. Similarly, if we look at the organizational level, Organizations need to articulate their purpose more than ever before. Millennials and Generation Z want to work for purposeful organizations. I ran a international study with the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education, where we asked thousands of students, business students all around the world, how much they would be willing to sacrifice to work for a responsible and purpose-driven organization. And to my shock and surprise, one in five students said that they would be willing to sacrifice over 40% of their salary to work for an employer who is holistically responsible. 95% said that they'll be willing to sacrifice some level of their salary to do the same. So if organizations want to succeed with potential and existing employees, consumers and many other stakeholders, the best way of doing it is having a very strong purpose, just like Patagonia that I showed you a minute ago, to explain how they are connecting who they are, what they're good at, we're an outdoor apparel company, with what you're known for, sustainability, to create a positive impact on the world. And then there is no limit to what can be done. There's no limit to what can be achieved. Because if I use everything that I know and everything that I'm known for to create a positive impact, the sky's the limit. So organizations now need to use storytelling and purpose to share a story of impact and engage all their stakeholders in, an, in a way that's exciting and insp inspiring. So I love this. Um, definition that came from a study done by EY on organizational purpose and the way that they define organizational purpose is an inspirational reason for being which inspires and provides a call to action for the organization and all its stakeholders to benefit the local and global society. Here you see organizational purpose is not to maximize profit, not to create shareholder value, not even to sell as many products or hire as many people as we can, not to crash the competition, but instead to benefit the local and global society. Purpose is about impact. Purpose is about service. And so if we use this definition together with the definition of purpose that I showed you before, you can now start to understand how organizations and individuals can now find their purpose and work according to it. So there are a lot of benefits to purpose that we should um, acknowledge because if we understand the benefits, it's kind of give us a why to find our why. And so the benefits of purpose are um, three or they go on three levels. 
the micro level um, benefits are about the people. So people who work or for the organization or with the organization, anyone from employees, consumers, suppliers, get very engaged and excited. They gain the shared narrative of impact and change, a sense of affiliation and pride. They get a sense of meaningfulness in their life and in their work. So even just working for a purpose-driven organization can fill my life with a sense of uh, meaningfulness and the sense that I'm doing something meaningful. Then looking at the organizational level, it can help promote your brand and your reputation, your performance, and become a destination of choice for purpose-driven people. And you want these people because they are intrinsically motivated to achieve their goals and their organizational goals. Most importantly, because we're talking about impact purpose, it's how we're serving society, creating societal change and social impact, and how do we use our power and our purpose to address all these wicked problems that we spoke about at the beginning. So here is another one of my favorite um, examples. And of course, none of the examples that I'm showing is of a perfect company. I don't know a perfect human being, and I don't know a perfect company. But through what they have, they're trying their benefit. So Ben and Jerry's um, founded in the 1970s in the US and became a global company. And they almost from the beginning had their three pillars, the first of which is their social mission, how to operate a company in a way that actively recognizes the central role that business plays in society and in initiating innovate, innovative ways to improve the quality of life locally, nationally, and internationally. I was very lucky two years ago to be in a CSR conference in Germany where the CSR director of Ben & Jerry's came to speak to us. And his words really resonated with me because he said, we are a social mission company, or we are a company with a social mission. We just happen to make ice cream. It's not about what they do, it's about why they do it. And so their very strong social mission means that they can do anything and they can address any social or environmental issues that they want because people know that they are a company with a soul. And that really resonates with people. Another idea I want to show you today is the concept of conscious capitalism. It was developed by John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods, and Professor Raj Sisodia, who I have the pleasure to write an article now with, um, with him on conscious leadership. And so conscious capitalism is about having four different tenets. At the center, there is higher purpose for the, um, for the company, for the leadership. These companies work with the higher purpose far beyond maximizing shareholder value. Again, how do we utilize who we are to create a positive impact on the world? They move from stakeholder management to stakeholder integration where they try to create scenarios where everyone wins. They call it the win to the power of six um, stakeholder integration because you create a win, 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 win for everyone involved in the company. These companies are led by conscious leaders who are passionate, they know themselves, they know the company, they are, they're seeing the world with empathy and passion um, and compassion. And that's the way that they move the whole company and everyone involved with it forward. Eight, conscious culture and management where everyone feels that this is embedded in every part of the organization. This is not philanthropy, this is not PR. It's not about you know, having a good report to put on the website, but really it is about how we approach this holistically. These kind of companies use social innovation to create an innovative idea to tackle social and environmental wicked problem, such as using novel products, technology, platforms, and enterprises that could really do nothing less than change the world. Um, and some of these 
companies that I showed you before are using social innovation? How can we rethink or think outside the box to come up with things that are more innovative? Um, so, you know, we could use this um, bottle of water. Of course, there are a lot of sustainable bottles of water, but, you know, we can make it a little bit uh, cuter because we also have the glass that goes with it. But this is just a small example that I can show you. Of course, innovation is in everything that these companies are doing. And it always starts with one question. What if? What if we can create solar panels that are so cheap, so easy to move around that everyone can have access to energy? What if we can tackle food um, insecurity but by creating um, vertical um, farms. There, there are tons of innovative ideas that we see all around us trying to come up with solutions to the wicked problems that we face. That leads me to social entrepreneurship and innovation. So social entrepreneurship means using business knowledge and tools and entrepreneurial principles to address social problems. So we're starting a company not because we want to sell products, not because we even want to address a consumer problem. And of course, not just because we want to maximize profit. We're starting a company because we see a social problem and we think, what can we do about it? And instead of starting a not-for-profit or charity or relying on governmental services, we say, why don't we use the power of business to do that? What if we can start a company, sell water to address the problem of not having access to clean water? And so social entrepreneurs are really motivated by addressing the social and environmental problems that we spoke about. A recent idea that just came up is social entrepreneurship. Just like business entrepreneurship where an employee innovates inside a business while being still employed by this business. And the most known example is Sony PlayStation, which was invented by one of Sony employees. Here we have employees coming up with solutions to social problems while being still employed by a, a company. So one of my favorite examples is a, an employee that worked in Westpac. He was in the HR department and he came up with the idea of how can we address the problem of uh, refugees. And he started an organization called I'm a Boat Person, where the uh, organization firstly was just about helping refugees. And then he actually partnered with Westpac and it became about refugees' financial literacy. He came up with all of these while still being employed. And I think he's still being employed by Westpac today. So he has this organization that he started, created a partnership with, with Westpac, and that became like a hobby. So you could see the difference between regular business and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. Is it for impact or for profit inside an organization or outside an organization? So here is an example of one of the most famous social enterprises in Australia, thank you, which was founded by these three young people that you see here at the bottom left. Daniel Flynn in the middle, he was only 19 when he discovered that 900 million people don't have access to clean water and all the by problems that go with it. And like many other young people, he could probably just turn away and you know go on and do his uni degree. But he was seeing this problem with empathy and compassion and he thought, what can I do about it? And then he said, what if, what if we could sell bottled water water to address this problem by building wells in the developing world. And that's exactly what he did. It took them three years to get off the ground, but then it became more and more successful. Because people buy why they do things, not what they do, they were able to do product diversification like no other company. So then they moved to body care to address the problem of sanitation and health. Um, thank you, baby, to address baby and mother's um, health. 
And so they continued doing it. They recently phased out the water because they said it's not sustainable to have all these plastic bottles. So they no longer sell thank you water. They also phased out thank you food, but they still have their big products. They're so innovative in everything that they do that even the book that Daniel Flynn wrote, which was used to actually fund the Thank You Baby project is written this way instead of this way. It's just really thinking outside the box in everything that we do and trying to inspire others and work with others to, to do the same. The last concept that I want to show you before we move on to the Q&A is corporate political activism, which is again something I'm very excited about and I started writing about that this year. It's about actions that are being taken, taken by the company or their leadership using their brand, not you know, as a private person, but as a company, just like the example I showed you with Patagonia, in order to address a perceived social or sustainability problems and try to change public opinion, policy, advocacy. But instead of advocating for their own interests, they are now advocating for the public interest. So they are, for example, taking a stand on um, LGBT rights, abortion, immigration, and gun control. And of course, in the US, all of these things are uh, still controversial. And so what, we've, what research shows is that when companies do that and they're doing it while still aligning with the brand and what they stand for and their holistic approach, then they can actually even increase their um, stock price. Here is an example, um, Airbnb. When we all were all asked to vote for the Marriage Equality Act um, or show our support on that a um, couple of years ago, Airbnb aligned their brand and their slogan of belong anywhere with until we all belong, selling a broken ring, encouraging people to vote yes and stand by the LGBTQ plus um, community, which was a really inspirational campaign backed up by Qantas and other Australian companies. They also have political campaigns running in the US uh, about refugees um, called uh, We Accept. And so they really use their brand and who the, you know, what they stand for to work with that. And that's a recent tweet that I found it from Ben and Jerry's. I'll give you a second to read it. So you can see where, you know, where they're coming from. Uh, this was just a month ago. For companies to be able to tweet things like, um, you know, the U.S. elections and, and voters, um, every vote counts and so on, was really un unthinkable just a few years ago. But corporate political activism is becoming increasingly popular and acceptable. In fact, People are starting asking companies, why don't you take a stance when things are not right around you? So this is the way I try to capture in 30 minutes how businesses can become a force for good using purpose, passion, compassion to really utilize their power, resources, and knowledge and address some of the wicked problems that we have. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my voice for 30 uh, minutes. Also feel free to connect on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And I'm really happy to open it up for Q&A. Rosario, do you want to jump off the mic and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sorry, I cannot switch on the, the video. Actually, okay, okay I can. I'm just Hello, in, in the unit. Hello, everyone. I'm under the, the tree of the uni. So, um, what I would like to ask, um, and also I put the, the question in the, in the chat because it's quite long. Um, basically, I was, um, I was focusing a lot this semester about uh, um, the, the capitalism, the social entrepreneurship. And what I would like to ask you is, um, is about um, the capitalism as, uh, um, and in particular the Patagonia case, as the new model so do you think that patagonia is a new model or is an exception 
can capitalists develop um, an ethical and moral aim and value? And I also would like to ask you if you know something about the idea of, um, that is the Marxist critique of the means of production that is like uh, um, an inside bias of the capitalism. Thank you for this great question. Wow. You ask me, can we change capitalism? I want to ask you, can we continue with it as it is? Because obviously, if we look at, you know, not capitalism as an idea, which is why I like the idea of conscious capitalism. They say, you know, we don't need to throw capitalism out the window, but we need to change it. Growth at any cost is no longer an option. Selling as many products as we can, regardless of the impact on the environment, is just no longer an option. We are living in a very narrow window of time where companies are still getting away with it. But a few years from now, it will not be possible anymore if we're not too late already. So we are seeing a movement by many young people as well as by business leaders to try and tackle capitalism. So we're not saying capitalism is bad. There are a lot of amazingly good things that came out of capitalism, including the COVID vaccine, which we could say, okay, these companies were motivated by the money that they were going to make. And it works well in, you know, balancing supply and demand. But we need to put some kind of boundaries on capitalism as it is. And since the 1980s, regulation on companies was really reduced. Um, and the result of it we see today. And we need to work together internationally, globally, to try and create capitalism which is sustainable. This is not just for the planet and the humans who inhabit it. This is also for the companies themselves. Because it's obvious, I mean, if you understand that we're using 1.5, the capacity of the earth right now to produce all our wants, it doesn't take a genius to understand that we'll not be able to do it over the long run. And so we really must change. There is no other way around it. All right, I'll try to keep Thanks. my answers a little bit shorter. <laughs> so we'll Thanks, Debbie. Started. We've just got Courtney with her hand raised. Courtney, do you want to jump on? Hi there. Um, sorry, my phone isn't working with the video, so I'm just going to have to do all this my voice. Okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, my question was, to what extent should the law intervene in this corporate social responsibility? Like, is there some sort of legal accountability that should be imposed, or do you think it should be left to self-regulation mm -hmm. as it currently is? A trillion-dollar question. There are some countries now who try to uh, create mandatory CSR. So for example, in India, companies, there is something called the CSR Act and companies with a revenue of over $1 million are obliged to give 2% to charity. In a way, it increased the revenue going to charities, but because it was compulsory, it also created some unethical behaviors of companies trying to get around it including creating their own not for profits and moving the money back into their own accounts. So we are trying to um, see if, you know, obviously you want people to be intrinsically motivated to be good. And, but we know that sometimes, at least until we internalize this kind of behavior, we might need external um, boundaries, regulations, legislations to um, get company. Um, so I'm not really very keen about forcing companies to give money to charity. I also don't think that CSR is really about giving money to charity. I think that CSR is about being holistically responsible and ethical in everything that you do. And giving money to charity is just a tiny part of that. But I think that we might need, until we get there, we might need to um, create some kind of legislation, maybe international law, about what companies are allowed to do to humans, animals, and um, the environment. I was just watching the um, Animals Australia new ad that came out this week about um, animal farms and um, 
industrial farming. And it's just heartbreaking. And the fact that they can get away with this kind of um, behavior and live experts and everything, and no one is stopping it is really devastating. And so we need to make sure that companies have to do the right thing. And hopefully, you know, more and more companies will come on board understanding that they, they should be interested in doing that. And that companies like Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's are actually doing better on the long run. Uh, I was just reading a book this week comparing the um, share value of Walmart versus Costco. And while it seems Walmart is doing really well despite um, bad human management um, behavior, Costco over you know, the last 10 years have done 10 times better than Walmart. Uh, and Costco pays their employees twice the minimum wage. So it's important to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say there's obviously a, like, you know, there's obviously a performance benefit to having CSR involved. But to just what I'm thinking is to what extent do you think that specific elements of CSR are already embedded in law? Like, for example, anti bribery and corruption laws, uh, animal rights legislation, employment rights legislation. Is there a specific need for a CSR related? specifically related law or do you think it's already embodied? Well, some, you know, we've got a lot of laws and legislation that are already tackling some parts of business um, irresponsibility to try and get companies to do less harm. I mean, even this week, having the law passed by um, internationally that Google will and uh, Facebook will have to pay companies for content, that's kind of corporate social responsibility because you have to pay people for the work that they've done. But we're still, despite Modern Slavery Act and all kind of acts trying to um, to uh, protect the environment, we still see you know 40 million people around the world are still trapped in modern slavery today. And so, with all the laws that we've got all around the world, there are um, loopholes that companies find. There are um, the um, lack of enforcement, there is corruption that allows companies to get away with it. It is a problem, but hopefully we'll get more holistic solutions in the future. Thank you, Debbie. We just have a question here from Nikki, who is actually in hotel quarantine with oh. her children that are full of energy and can't put video or audio on. So Nikki, I'll, uh, I'll read this one out for you. Um, she says, thank you very much for your presentation, Debbie. How do you characterize the relationship between CSR and ESG? Okay, ESG or environmental, social and governance criteria is part of what creates corporate social responsibility. So some companies are saying our CSR is about addressing these three issues. Um, it's not exactly the same um, concept. And I think CSR, especially when looked upon holistically, can be seen as a broader idea rather than um, just looking at ESG criteria for making decisions or reporting and, and so on. For me, holistic CSR is about how we embed ethical behavior in every part of the organization. So it's not just some kind of criteria, it's not part of the report. Um, obviously, it's about the environment, it's about social uh, responsibility, and it's about governance. So there is a connection between the two. But it also go about um, how do we make sure that we always do the right thing by everyone? How do we work with all our stakeholders? And so on. So these two concepts are closely related, but they're not the same. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, we have a great question here from Mutsa. Thanks again. Um, do you think leaders re require compulsory training in consciousness and empathy? The current global situation seems to indicate we are leadership poor in the sense that we have leaders that lack certain traits required to lead, whether that be in a company or a country. Very good question. Excellent question. And I couldn't agree more. I think leadership, while organization can become socially responsible or force for good, bottom up, it's so much harder uh, compared to when there is a buy-in from the leadership at the top. We need new kinds of leaders. We need leaders who lead with compassion and caring, 
who are um, knowledgeable about everything that we discuss that see these problems with empathy and with innovative ways of addressing them. And this also requires a new kind of leadership development. So we cannot just continue with the old leadership development where we just look at aspects of how do we manage people, money, and, and so on. Even as a business school, I think we see a huge shift in business management education from just looking at how do we teach students financial management and marketing to how do we teach them um, social innovation and um, creating impact and social entrepreneurship and so on. We've seen business schools changing completely to have an MBA that's solely focused on sustainability and sustainable development. We really need to rethink the way that we talk about leadership, help prepare leaders, and the next generation of leaders and how we help to develop leaders that are conscious, compassion, um, and purpose-driven. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and I actually have my own question, if you don't mind me jumping in. It kind of relates to Mutz's question. Um, what can we do as employees to influence the organizational team that we work in, um, just to be more pur purposeful or empathetic? That's an excellent question. And I would actually look at it in two different ways. If there is youth support from the company and its leadership towards social responsibility, see what the company is already doing and take part in that. So you could participate in corporate volunteering and payroll giving because you know the company is already doing all these things. Um, push for sustainability. There is employee-led CSR where employees can suggest um, organizations and they to work with, they can suggest projects. Um, there is also social entrepreneurship that I spoke about. But that's in case you align with the company's values, ethics, and social responsibility. If you work for a company that you don't think is fully responsible or purpose-driven right now, you have two choices. You can either leave and look for a new job, <laughs> or you can try to change the company bottom-up. The best way to do it is try to create a coalition with as many uh, like-minded people as you can. So find colleagues, managers, leaders who also believe in uh, sustainability. Bring up the numbers, show, you know, create the business case for the company to shift. And there are tons of resources now that can be used to actually show that sustainable and socially responsible companies don't just do good, they also do well. And so this is something that you can do as an employee. Of course, it's hard, but there are examples of companies that were changed bottom up and from, you know, even like a um, couple of people in Bain & Co. who started a green office and a green team to change the sustainability of the company. There are a lot of examples from employees all around the world who are aiming to change the, the company that they work for. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else want to jump off mute to ask Debbie a question? Sid. Hi there. Hi, Debbie. I have a quick question for you. Um, what's your sense of um, uh, the, the, the way that CSR is being embraced at a governance level, at a board level? Are you seeing some change in the dynamic at, at a governance level in, in Australia or, or, or around the world? And can you point to organizations that, that are demonstrating that at a board level they're embracing it holistically? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, the examples that I gave you, I try to really focus on companies that are doing it more holistically. Um, and we are seeing a, a slow shift in governance and in, in um, boards and in the way that companies are managed externally and internally to try and shift towards more of a um, sustainable future. I can't really think of a Australian company right now um, that's doing it really well. I had a few examples. Some of them, for example, were from Australian banks and then came the Royal Commission and showed me otherwise. So it's really hard for me to find an example of a big you know, Australian company that I can say is really doing it well holistically. There are a lot of Australian companies that are aiming to become more sustainable um, pharmaceutical companies, banks, um, the um, big 
or in consultancy, they're all doing really great things but I can't say that any of them is the, you know, poster child of holistic CSR. Thank you, Debbie. I tend to agree with you. I think it's, it's piecemeal. Um, and, and I think it's very narrow uh, in the way that it's being thought about. It's about avoiding damage rather than the greater holistic view of CSR. So thank you. Exactly. But to judge, you know, what is happening in Europe and in some other countries, the pressure is accumulating. And I think more and more companies are going to stop feeling the stakeholder pressure. And people are starting to demand that companies, um, even universities, will become more purpose driven and show holistically that they really are responsible and ethical. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so I was giving you some food for thought today, not just about business as a force for good, but also about developing our personal purpose as individuals, as employees, and of course, as managers. And I think the next big thing about purpose is not just becoming a purpose-driven personal organization, but how are you becoming a purpose enabler? How are you allowing others around you to feel the same sense of purpose? How employers are going to become purpose enablers? And that's the next big thing. So with this, I think we can almost finish today. So thank you, everyone. And a big thank you to you, Debbie. Thanks for joining us today and ending the series on a high. Um, three words that I'm definitely taking away today, purpose, passion, and responsibility, and lots of food for thought. Um, some lovely comments coming through the chat box, people saying thank you, Debbie, for a great presentation, very inspiring, amazing listening to you. So thank you so much for your time um, and enjoy your break. And I can't wait to uh, read your next book. <laughs> 2021 you. release, is that what we're looking for? Oh, I just at? finish it. <laughs> finish it first, then I'll read it. <laughs> Thanks for right, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for joining us. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the holiday break. season. Bye. Bye bye.